Uh, okay, so uh, today we're starting chapter 22, and I do want to let you guys know that uh, we just have two more chapters of traditional organic chemistry material, meaning the material that you'll find in any organic chemistry two semester sequence, certainly nationwide, quite possibly worldwide. Um, and not only that, the two chapters are closely related. Both of them have to do with reactions of carbonyl compounds at the alpha carbon, meaning the carbon that's next door to the carbonyl carbon. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's it. Once we've uh, done that, it will really be like, I have nothing further to teach you, Grasshopper. We'll still have a couple of biochem chapters. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, on the very last day of class, uh, engineering and material science majors and majors in other fields like that have been very patient over the two semesters as we've uh, covered, mm, and I mean, I'm no biochemist, but th there's a certain slight biochem emphasis to organic chemistry. And you've patiently waited through that. The last day of class is all yours. We're gonna do polymers that day. Uh, good, but none of that will contain anything new. By the time we finish chapters 22 and 23, there will be absolutely nothing new. And even in these two chapters, I don't think I'm going to have too much here that's going to surprise you greatly. Uh, good. So a couple things we need to get down first. Uh, I think we've already used the terms keto and enol forms. Uh, and we may even have sort of defined them with structures like this, and that's fine. But uh, uh, the keto form and enol form are, um, are uh, isomers. And they're a special type of isomer that we call tautomers. And by the way, I should mention, although we call this the keto form, this carbonyl compound does not have to be a ketone. It can be any carbonyl compound. The one requirement for there to be both keto and enol forms is that you must have at least one alpha proton meaning at least one proton on the carbon next to the carbonyl carbon. If there are no alpha protons, game over. There is no enol form. You've got only the keto form in that case. Um, and one can think of examples of compounds like that. What if you just had a benzophenone, which is a carbonyl with two benzene rings on it? There's no alpha protons. So benzophenone has no enol form. But as long as you have at least one proton alpha to the carbonyl, game on. You can have an enol form. Uh, nearly always, uh, the enol form is disfavored in the equilibrium and the keto form is favored. When I say nearly always, you're probably talking 95 plus percent of the time. We'll go over how you can know when you're in one of that other 5%. And I think when I show you that, it's not going to be anything terribly surprising or upsetting. I think, uh, I think it will make a lot of sense. Uh, please do note before anything else, this is an equilibrium. I'm using an equilibrium arrow. I've moved atoms in these two structures. So these really are flipping back and forth. This is a mobile equilibrium uh, in general at room temperature. And you will have at all times keto forms converting to enols, enol forms converting to the keto form. And that goes back and forth in a very mobile fashion. But again, in general, you'll have more of the keto form at any one time than, than of the enol form. So this word tautomers, I was thinking of this earlier. Uh, I feel like that's a special term for a certain kind of um, constitutional isomers, which these are. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think if I can rack my brain to come up with another place where the word tautomer is used, except in the ketoenol situation. And nothing, I'm trying, but nothing's coming to mind. But uh, you can call them the keto and enol tautomers. And I, it may be that that term is special just for the ketoenol type situation. Um, it would have to be something awfully like that. Like maybe if you replace the oxygen with a nitrogen, you could call those two species tautomers also, but I'm having trouble coming up with a, there must be one. I'm, maybe I'm just drawing a blank. So, uh, so that's the first thing to get down is that as long as you have at least one alpha proton, any carbonyl compound, not just ketones, 
exists in both keto and enol tautomers, and those two are in equilibrium with one another. But we need to unpack that further. And by the way, uh, the theme of today, or at least one of the themes of today is Welcome to resonance versus equilibrium hell, because this is where it comes in with, uh, with the, the keto and enol stuff. So, and it basically works as follows. Uh, here again is our keto form. Uh, and we'll go over these mechanisms, which I can pretty much guarantee you will come as no surprise to you when you see them. But as you can imagine, if you remove a proton from the keto form to get its conjugate base, that conjugate base is called an enolate ion. And uh, uh, not only that, but the enolate ion is also the conjugate base of the enol form. So you can get to the enolate by deprotonating either the keto form or the enol form. The keto form, of course, is the carbon, the enol form is the hydrogen. Uh, and likewise, you can go from the enolate back to either of those two by adding a proton. So this is a more sketched out version of this scheme. What it's saying is that, uh, what it's saying is uh, that the process of going between the keto and enol forms has this enolate ion as its intermediate. So, so it's, uh, so, so yeah, so that's the intermediate between the two. Unfortunately, here's where the hell part comes. Unfortunately, the enolate ion is a resonance stabilized species. So you've got resonance arrows and equilibrium arrows in the same scheme. Uh, so <laughs> this uh, now, if at any time, we need to be really, really clear on the difference between uh, equilibrium and resonance. You have to have that down cold in order to understand what's going on here. So. When we say that the enolate ion is a resonance stabilized species, what we mean is not an equilibrium, not flipping back and forth. Uh, any enolate ion has one true structure, but that structure is difficult, if not impossible, to show with just simple valence bond structures like we normally are used to using, which again, 95% of the time is perfectly adequate for describing the structure. Uh, of organic molecules. Here is one of those cases, like in benzene, where it breaks down. And so what we mean when we say that is that all enolate ions are at all times a hybrid, a mixture of those two structures, such that some of the minus charges in the oxygen and some of the minus charges in the carbon. But again, at all times, there's no flipping back and forth. Um, if I were to ask you to take a wild guess, which of these two resonance forms was the major contributor to the hybrid? In other words, if I were to ask you whether there's more minus charge in carbon or more minus charge in oxygen, and you took a wild guess, I'm confident your wild guess would overwhelmingly be that there's more minus charge in the oxygen. And of course, you'd be absolutely right. There is more minus charge in the oxygen. However, interestingly, uh, enolate ions usually react at the carbon atom with electrophiles, not at the oxygen atom. Uh, the reason for that is unfortunately well beyond the scope of this course. It has to do with something called hard soft acid base theory. And if you go on to take inorganic chemistry, you'll likely cover it there, but it's quite beyond the pale for us. It gets into some, some pretty deep stuff. But uh, suffice it to say, enolate ions are very good nucleophiles, but they will generally react as nucleophiles at the carbon atom. Uh, and we, we won't get into any particular reactions at that carbon atom today. That's going to start on Wednesday. But you'll see that that's the case. You'll see uh, that they're going to react at the carbon atom. Are there electrophiles that will react at the oxygen? The answer is yes. We're not going to cover it. At least I, I don't think so. I think we're going to do only these standard ones uh, that react at the carbon. And by the way, it's pretty hard to get it to react at the oxygen. And even when you do, it's oftentimes a mixture. So, uh, but reacting at the carbon atom is quite straightforward. And that's what we're going to start on on Wednesday. Um, where else was I at? Uh, oh, one other thing of note. Uh, as usual with a resonance stabilized species, what this is going to mean for us is that when you're drawing a mechanism, of course, you won't in general draw both resonance forms unless it says to. 
but, but instead, when you have an enolate ion as an intermediate in a mechanism you're drawing, it doesn't matter which of these resonance forms you use. They're both completely correct. And you can draw a correct mechanism using either. So, uh, so that's going to be up to you. I think I generally prefer this one. There may be times I use this one. I feel like I lean towards this one. But you don't have to. If in your mechanism you want to use the resonance form that shows the minus charge in carbon, go right ahead. Absolutely correct. Uh, that would be another case. Well, I always say not only would I not take off points, I wouldn't even know. Well, I would notice, you know, there are different structures. But as long as you drew them correctly and otherwise your mechanism is correct, I'll just see it as being the same thing and move on. So, uh, so what this means is that the overall scheme of going between uh, keto and enol forms is an equilibrium that again, usually favors the keto form. We'll get to cases when it doesn't. And I, I think when we present that, you'll find it makes a lot of sense. But the enolate ion is the intermediate in between. And unfortunately that enolate ion is resin stabilized. So please be very careful which types of arrows you draw and please be sure you're really, really clear on the difference between equilibrium and resonance. It's absolutely critical in order to understand what goes on here. And so the reason I'm hitting this particularly hard uh, is because uh, uh, um, by my experience, this is a topic that uh, students especially uh, stumble over, and I think quite understandably. And as you know, I've said this before, uh, there is simply no way that every single thing you need to know for exams is going to come out of my mouth in class. There's just not enough time. Uh, rather, I choose to use class time to emphasize those things that, in my experience, need the most explanation for the most people. Um, I, I've tried doing kind of the mile wide and inch deep treatment it was a disaster. I couldn't get it to work. Some professors can do that and make it work. I'm not one of them. Okay, uh, so far so good then. Any questions on uh, keto and enol forms on the equilibrium that's between them? Of course, we'll eventually get into some particular examples here. Here I'm keeping things very general, but in a little while, we'll start to get a little more specific. Ellen and Barnaby still sleeping in a heap, a cat heap. Good. Well, let's cover this topic then. Why is it that enols are usually pretty unstable? And we can answer that at a couple of levels. Uh, we already know that alkenes will react with electrophiles. That was chapter seven and eight last term. We know that they can give up a lone pair from the alkene pi bond and react with a wide variety of electrophiles. That's what we covered uh, in chapters seven and eight. <clears throat> of course, enols can do the same thing, only more so because the presence of this oxygen, uh, which is electron donating by resonance, will add more electron density to the alkene and make it even more willing to extend out this electron pair <clears throat> and react with that electrophile. And we'll say a little bit more about that in a second, I would think. Um, but uh, so that's one piece. Uh, the, the presence of the oxygen makes this pi bond even more electron rich. And so that's why uh, enols are, are so reactive, so unstable. They really, really like to react with uh, electrophiles, just as alkenes do without the oxygen, only even more so because of the presence of the oxygen. But we could go on. Uh, let's take both of these a step further. And we'll find out, I think, even more about, uh, and of course, we're all fans of the octet rule around here. We really don't want to have 10 electrons around oxygen. So there we go. So let's compare these two intermediates. Uh, and I think you'll find a good reason why it is that uh, enols make good uh, nucleophiles. Enolate ions all the more so, because on top of everything we're about to say here, they've got a minus charge also. So they're even more reactive towards, towards uh, electrophiles. 
but even neutral enols are excellent nucleophiles uh, for a similar reason as alkenes without the OH, but even more so. And I think when you compare the intermediates that you get after either of these two will attack an electrophile, uh, you see a noticeable difference. All we really need, and again, I'm being very generic here, so I'm gonna, just gonna use B for base. All you need is some moderately decent base to come along that could even be, say, a water molecule if you're an aqueous solution. But all you need to do is deprotonate and you're done. You've got yourself a neutral uh, product. That's not quite the same situation uh, with the alkene. And again, since we're fans of the octet rule, we'll go and put our lone pair back on. So all you need is to deprotonate it and you're done. That's not so uh, with an unstabilized alkene, so one that does not have the OH of the enol. In order to get any kind of neutral product, and I think you'll see this is the case if you go back and review your uh, chapter seven and chapter eight material, we need some other species to come along and act as a nucleophile and attack that carbocation carbon. And uh, only then can we isolate a neutral product. And again, I'm being very generic with E's and B's and NU's, you know, but I think the point is still made uh, that quite a bit more is required to get a neutral product out of uh, uh, an electrophilic addition reaction with, a, with, an, with an alkene, with an unstabilized alkene. Unstabilized meaning there's nothing there like the OH and the enol. You can get a neutral product, but you need this extra piece. You need the nucleophile around. Without that, uh, you, you, don't, you don't even need that if, if the nucleophile is an enol as opposed to a regular alkene. In that case, once you attack your electrophile, all you need to do is deprotonate and you're done. And you'll also recall proton transfer steps are exceedingly fast kinetically. They're, they're the fastest type of step there is. So, uh, so that's part of the reason why we have uh, such strong reactivity of even enols, never mind enolates, which are even more nucleophilic, but even neutral enols are quite nucleophilic compared to just an alkene. And these reactions, we understand. We covered them uh, in detail in chapters seven and eight. So you might want to review that. Never a bad idea. Uh, it's always good practice for the final exam, uh, which again, recall, as I've said, uh, the final exam, it's, it's unavoidable that it's going to be cumulative for both terms. You can't avoid it because the material is all cumulative. I mean, I'm not going to go back and try to purposely, you know, come up with specific little things from say chapter five to, be, to make 40 points on the exam, the final exam with. But that being said, you've got to know chapter five, you've got to know about uh, stereochemistry, you still have to know about R and S forms, you know, it's unavoidable in order to understand uh, the, the uh, second semester material. Good, okay, so any questions then on uh, this issue of uh, why enols are so reactive relative to uh, regular alkenes without the OH. And while you think about this, I'll just add, starting next time, we'll get into some particular reactions of this type, uh, where the enol form can act as a nucleophile. As well, we'll cover others where the, nu where the nucleophile is an enolate ion. Those, of course, will be under uh, alkaline conditions. Uh, under neutral to acidic conditions, though, we'll find that it's the enol form that's going to be the, uh, the, the, the major nucleophile. Good, where are we at? 1228. Okay, well, let me move to uh, my other uh, uh, window over here. Let's consider then for a moment what types of species you would need to tip the equilibrium over so that it actually favors the enol form. 
And I think you'll find in general, the most common situation of that type is when you have what's called a beta dicarbonyl compound. This compound you could call, oh, what about 2,4-pentane dione, right? One, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four, if you come from the other side. 2,4-pentane dione, I think sounds good. This is just an example of this type, but it could be any compound that has two carbonyl groups with a carbon in between. Uh, and of course, we still need that carbon in between to have at least one alpha proton. And we're gonna look at, at some of these later on too, or in this chapter, I, I'm nearly positive in this chapter, we'll be doing the uh, malonic ester and acetoacetic ester syntheses. So they involve compounds of this type. And it's generally uh, compounds of this type where you find the enol form is much more favored or less disfavored than in compounds with just one carbonyl group. Uh, in fact, it can be favored to the point that the equilibrium flips over and favors the enol form. And I'm only giving you these, these numbers here, these experimental figures, because I happen to have them in my lecture notes. Of course, I would never expect you to know numbers like that or even uh, speculate on them. But I would expect you in a case like this to say, well, since we have a, a beta dicarbonyl compound, there's going to be a lot more of the enol form than we would otherwise have predicted, say, compared to a compound with just one carbonyl group. And I would say the reason for that is twofold. One that a student in the previous class pointed out is conjugation. And he was absolutely right. Indeed, in the process of forming the enol, uh, you wind up with the new carbon-carbon double bond being conjugated to one of the carbonyls. The same would be true, by the way, if we made the other but equivalent enol form, in which case your carbon-carbon double bond will be here and it'll be conjugated to that carbonyl. So in this particular case, those two enols are equivalent. Uh, if, this, if the original species were unsymmetrical, then they would not be. Here, since they're symmetrical, it's symmetrical, they're actually equivalent species. Uh, but that's one of the reasons. You do get a conjugated species, whereas you started with one that was not conjugated. But even more so, what you will find with these beta dicarbonyl species is that when you form the enol, there's the possibility for not just hydrogen bonding, but inter intramolecular hydrogen bonding. And not only intramolecular hydrogen bonding, but one in which you form a six-membered ring. And as you know, five and six-membered rings are good stuff in terms of energy. Three and four, not so much. Uh, seven, not so much. Eight, not so much. But five and six-membered rings are, are very good in terms of uh, uh, either transition states or real species like this one. And actually, even three-membered rings in certain ways are better than four-membered rings, which is surprising. But uh, I don't know if we'll ever come across a case like that, but if we do, we'll point it out then. Good, so uh, no wonder that this enol form is so stable compared to the, to the uh, keto form, even to the point that with this particular compound, it's favored in something like a three to one ratio of the enol form over, over the keto form. So those are the ones that I think you'll find are exceptional, uh, where there's more of the enol form than we might have guessed, and like I said, in some of these cases, the equilibrium will actually favor the enol form. Even if it doesn't, you would find more of the enol form than you would normally expect. But, uh, but it can even go as far as something like this. So those are the ones that I think you'll need to look out for. And we'll look at some examples of these and we'll actually uh, uh, take advantage of that special reactivity of the enol form. Good. So the main other thing I want to go over is uh, the mechanisms for uh, interconversion between the enol and keto forms, which can happen in either acidic or alkaline solution. Uh, once we've covered that, I do have some reef pulling questions for you guys today, uh, but I want to save that for the very end because one of the questions is about last class's material and the other is about this class's material. So I think that makes the most sense. Uh, good, any questions then on, uh, on uh, these beta dicarbonyl compounds and why uh, the, the enol 
can be can be favored much more so than usual there. <clears throat> Just making sure that I'm not forgetting anything really obvious. Yes, but but like I said, uh, today's not really the day for particular reactions. That will start when we get to 22.3 next time. Good, well then let's unpack this. Let's consider uh, the mechanism for the equilibrium that we talked about on the previous page. Um, and uh, as happens so often, it's going to depend largely on whether we are in acidic solution or alkaline solution. I always like to start with the acidic one uh, and get it over with because it's generally a little harder. So interestingly, in both cases, it's two steps. Uh, that's because the, the, the reaction is relatively simple. We're not needing to do a bunch of extra proton transfers. But uh, I'm here using acetophenone as just an example of a species that does, uh, that, uh, uh, of a carbonyl compound that also has an enol form. I could have picked anything else. Uh, I could even have used acetone. I could have used cyclohexanone. You know, you, you get the idea. But, uh, but I just chose to use this one because this, because uh, of, of course, acetophenone is three alpha protons and you only need one. So we're good to go in terms of an enol form. And if I'd ask you again with the wild guesses to take a wild guess as to what the first step is in acidic solution, you'd probably all have guessed uh, protonate the carbonyl oxygen. And once again, that wild guess would have been exactly right. We need to do that to avoid getting species that don't make sense in acidic solution. Uh, once we do that, we've protonated that carbonyl oxygen. Now we can do the proton transfer and pull off the proton that's in the alpha carbon. We can use the electrons in the carbon hydrogen bond to come in and make a carbon carbon pi bond. And then after that, of course, we need to break the carbon oxygen pi bond. Otherwise carbon would have five bonds and that's, that's a bad thing. Actually, it's not a thing at all. And so we put those electrons onto the oxygen, get rid of the plus charge, and you've got your enol form. So that's, that's that how that pathway would look in acidic solution. And I, I really should have drawn uh, equilibrium arrows for both of those, because those steps are, all of these steps that you see here are, are all reversible. So uh, you can also, the, the pathway to go from the enol form to the keto form is this same mechanism, but exactly backwards. So you would start by shoving these electrons in and picking up a proton over here. So now you've got a methyl group here, and then you would deprotonate this oxygen to give you the neutral keto form. But, but these steps are both reversible. What about an alkaline solution? Well, in alkaline solution, we wouldn't worry about protonating the carbonyl oxygen. In fact, we better not. You know, that's, that species wouldn't make sense in alkaline solution. It's far too acidic. So instead, the steps go in the opposite order. We'll start by pulling off that alpha proton, swinging in the electrons to make a carbon-carbon pi bond, and breaking the carbon-oxygen pi bond and putting the minus charge in oxygen. In other words, in, in, in basic solution, uh, you will go first to the enolate ion. And that makes sense. We would expect to see an enolate in basic solution. We would not expect to see it in acidic solution but we would expect to see it here. And then very straightforward, uh, this would simply pick up a proton from whatever protic solvent is around. Here we've got water around. So that puts the proton on, you get your neutral enol form. To go back from the enol form to the keto form in, uh, in basic solution, you would start by deprotonating the oxygen, getting the enolate. And then you would run that first step in reverse. You would uh, you would push electrons here to reform the carbonyl, break the carbon-carbon pi bond, use it to pick up a proton from water, and then, uh, and then you're there, then you're back in your keto form. So all of these steps are fully reversible. And in fact, if you want to, in fact, why don't we just do that? Pixels don't cost much, and it's not like it's going to be a lot of effort. But since we happen to know that all of these steps are reversible, there's nothing wrong with showing them that way. So the mechanism to go in the other direction is the same. It's just exactly backwards. It's just run in reverse. So uh, that's going to be helpful uh, when we start to get into the chemistry of enols and enolates. So 
this type of thing is, is going to be pretty important to know about because uh, there's, first of all, going to be some reactions that include this type of tautomerization process. Uh, and even if not, it's going to be important to understand that you can get between those species like that. So let me just make sure. Just want to be sure I'm not cheating you out of anything. Well, we talked about how they need a nucleophile. Nope, I think we're good. So that's a good place to stop today. That still leaves us 10 minutes to do our, uh, our reef polling. So we can be very relaxed and slow about that. Any questions on any of this material then on uh, uh, why enols are so reactive, on uh, what you need to have in order for uh, in order to have an enol form that's more stable than, than the keto form at equilibrium, on the nature of that nasty uh, equilibrium and resonance at the same time thing. All right, well, how should we approach this? Well, uh, again, at pH equals seven, that's the form we would expect this molecule to take. Uh, at pH 7, we're well above the pKa of this carboxylic acid functional group, which by virtue of the amino group in the same molecule, uh, these, the, these carboxylic acids and amino acids are even more acidic um, than ordinary carboxylic acids. Those come in at about 4, 5, 4 and a half, somewhere in there in terms of pKa. Uh, the carboxylic acid, so the, the conjugate acid of this, will actually have a pK around two and a half. So they're a good thousand times more acidic than carboxylic acids normally are. So that's why this is deprotonated because we're above at pH seven, we're above that pKa, but we're below the pKa's of these ammonium groups. Those should be more like nine, nine and a half, ten, 10, somewhere in there. So at pH seven, we're below that. So these two amino groups are gonna be protonated. And so what's our overall charge at pH seven? I guess plus one, right? But at pH 14, then we will go above the pKa's of these, of these ammonium groups also. So if they have a pKa around 10 or nine and a half, if we're well above that at pH 14, now these will become deprotonated and they will go to the amine free base form. So NH2 with the lone pair. Uh, and as such, that means the only charge left I think is still gonna be the minus charge on the carboxylate. So unless I've lost my mind, which is always a possibility, I think the overall charge at pH 14 will be minus one, which is B. So uh, let, me grade, let me grade that first. Mm, I don't think so. I think it's gonna be negative. Now at, uh, at pH one, what would we have? Well, at pH one, the carboxylic acid will get protonated again. Now we're below all of those pKa's. So I think in that case, the overall charge would be plus three, wouldn't it? But uh, I, I like, as I said, I like these three, three pHs, one, seven, and 14. I don't see the need to muddy the waters further. At those three pHs, it's always completely clear what, what, what uh, all the protonation states are. So something to look at later, maybe. And then from today's material, move this out of the way. Oh, it's already out of there, good. Which of the following compounds has no enol form? There is exactly one such compound. And I think we made that pretty clear when we talked about the requirements for a carbonyl compound to have an enol form in addition to its keto form. All right, well, hopefully you'll recall us saying that in order to have an enol form, a carbonyl compound must have at least one alpha proton. Fine if it is more than one, but there must be at least one. And we've actually used acetophenone already today. There's three alpha protons in the methyl group. Likewise, this diacetylpropyl ketone, or I guess we would call that what? Maybe 2,4-dimethyl-3-pentanone or something like that. Uh, this one is two alpha protons, one on each of the isopropyl groups. So that one is an enol form. Uh, this is acetaldehyde, and of course that has three alpha protons right here. Acetaldehyde is an enol form. Here you've got cyclopentanone. Cyclopentanone is no fewer than four alpha protons. So certainly there's an enol form. The only one that would not have an enol form 
uh, is this crazy one here, which I'm not even going to try to name. Uh, so I think the best answer is D, because as you see, if you look on both of the alpha carbons are quaternary. So there's no protons there. So this one exists only in the keto form. There is no enol form. So I think the best answer is D, as did you guys. Good. So, well, other than that, I believe that's about it. So have a good day, and I will see you all on Wednesday. And hopefully we'll know more about the exams by then.